Hi guys, I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. Welcome to the Goop Podcast. Every Thursday, Goop editors will be sitting down with provocative thinkers, industry disruptors, and culture changers. I'll take turns interviewing barrier-breaking guests as we talk about shifting old paradigms and starting new conversations. Today's guest is weirdly hard for me to introduce because she's my mom, Blythe Danner. You might know her from the stage. She won a Tony before I was born at age 26 for her turn in Butterflies Are Free. Or you might think of her as Dina Burns from Meet the Parents. More recently, she starred in a couple of films by Brett Haley. She was utterly phenomenal in I'll See You in My Dreams. And the next, Hearts Beat Loud, comes out this summer. Growing up, I saw her both as my mom and as an actress, and I was always curious about who she was on the stage as opposed to off the stage. While it can be hard to get her to open up, she really did in our conversation today. I wish I had enjoyed it more. I sort of felt I didn't, I hate to say it because it sounds sort of, but I assure you it's true. I felt I didn't deserve it. In advance of Mother's Day, we sat down and talked about the impact she's had on me and vice versa, as well as how her parents and later my dad shaped her life and career. He was my big savior. You know, I met him and immediately just womp, just felt this is the only person. And, and I adored my my father and my brothers, but the first person who I felt was completely comfortable in his own skin. I don't think I had ever experienced quite that. Now let's get to my mom, Blythe Danner. Thanks for coming on the Goop Podcast. Oh, my darling. I can't believe you asked your mother. Of course. You don't even return my calls. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) How how I got into this, I'll never know. Why am I sounding like your father? I'm trying to do a Brooklyn accent. (laughs) He's here. He's with us. He's hovering. He's hovering in the room. (laughs) And so when I was thinking about questions that I wanted to ask you, I feel like I got so much of my femininity and creativity and artistry from you. And I'm just really curious about when you felt that in yourself and, and kind of the path that you, that it put you on. Well, what about your father's pink cashmere socks? And choosing... We're not talking about my father. <laughs> this is not about him. I'd rather talk about him and you. I had no consciousness of that. No, I was raised in a household where in the 50s, 40s, you uh, were expected to be daddy's little girl and my mother as you know was very conscious of bows and external appearances yeah and, uh, yes and uh i think you know i think music had such such a major chord in my life and our family's life those were the happiest times i can remember what was it like it was an escape to something that was joyful and you know all families are complicated and if there was any stress or it was a way my father had a glorious voice so did my mother and my brother and we all sang and we would harmonize and harmonize did Not, anybody play the piano uh yeah my brother played the piano and would you all kind of gather around together and well, sing? We always, well, as you know, at our parties, that was that was the main attraction. And my parents <laughs> would have parties that would go. My mom tried to once have a uh, Christmas party. She always did invite somebody at five to seven, seven to nine, nine to eight. People did that long ago. And nobody would ever leave. They'd all wait for the singing. And they had opera f- singer friends. And the house was just so full of joy. So your father was a banker, but he was also, he moonlit as an opera singer? As a singer in, in different churches and uh, with the Philadelphia Chamber Orchestra. Mom and dad met at the Philadelphia Choral Society. So they just, that was just a, such an important part. And I guess I don't, as I say, I don't remember any conscious femininity. I think it was just because I was as a matter of fact, I think my mom was disappointed because she would have me all dressed up in beautiful little crinolines and 
hair perfect, and two minutes later I was a mess because I was a tomboy. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm the way that I mean femininity in this context is sort of that connection to yourself and the, the softness and the imagination oh. and the art more than like physical femininity. Yeah, I know, but I am not that deep. <laughs> I can't go there. No, I I just remember wanting always to escape somehow myself. And that didn't have, I wasn't in in an unhappy family. I mean, it was a lot of, as I say, everyone's complicated. But I remember staring into the mirror and saying my name over and over and over. And all of a sudden I'd go whomp into the, I'd go into outer space. And I loved being somebody other than than me. And you were hypnotizing yourself? I, th- I guess it was. And, and I think that's why I was so drawn to acting ultimately. Yeah. I told you I was listening to your friend the other day on NPR, Tandy Newton, who was saying she was so happy to f- escape into acting because she didn't have to be yeah. herself. And I remember what how surprised I was when you told Katie Couric you were interested, drawn to acting, because when you saw your mother... And then we won't talk about me anymore. Oh, sure. Uh, when she, when, when you saw me on stage, I was seen much, so much more powerful than I was in life. And that really startled me because I'd never consciously thought of that. But it's absolutely true and accurate. I think a lot of actors are drawn. What insecure. do you think you were, you wanted to escape from when you talk about escaping? Myself. Because I think, unlike you, thank goodness you have a good, strong part of your dad. And I think you came into the world with a very strong self-image, and I couldn't, I couldn't harm that. I may have tried. I may have tried to sway you to, you know, being more conforming to what I thought was the proper young girl. And you were a rebel from the beginning, but thank God. I mean, I had, when I think of your extraordinary talent as a little girl. You knew my speeches before I did it, too. We were Williamstown with Chekhov and harmonizing, speaking of which you, I would do a simple third above the melody. And you were doing it, too, sixes and sevens and harmonics. I'd, say, I'd, do, du- I'd do double takes and say, what? Who is this? The piano teacher threw the book away, said, I can't teach her a thing. It's all by ear with her. And you just always... And you had a strength and you knew who you were. And, and even though, and I should have been wise enough. And that's, that's what still goes, bothers me, that I didn't have the wisdom, which I think your dad did, to observe, to know that you were this creature. Unlike anything I knew, this combination of our crazy genes, possibly. Do you think that, I mean... When I think about you being little and being a tomboy and loving music, it sounds a lot like me. And so I just wonder, do you feel like, because your mother was so strong, do you think she she sort of disconnected you from yourself in some way? Like, did she kind of suppress that or you were trying to kind of be what she wanted you to be and you lost something? She encouraged, I mean, she was very funny and, you know, she encouraged uh, the music and she encouraged creativity. It's just that uh, as I, I don't know, wish I knew exactly how to answer that. I don't remember her suppressing those Well, there was a lot of like blaming and shaming, well, right? Yeah. I mean I you know, German Lutheran background, I mean it's uh and I was very religious growing up because to me, you know, Luther League and going to church and again the music was what was so wonderful. My brother and I would walk home singing. Um so there was that element, yeah. Which is also probably why I chose your father who was antithetical to all of that. It certainly my was. wild man. <laughs> my irreverent Brucey. Uh and but I wouldn't blame I mean I guess that's very difficult when you you know, everybody has an element of that in their family. There are very few families I think that are without that Absolutely. element of discord or b- blaming. Yeah. That's true. But I really did adore 
my mom, especially. I don't know why. (laughs) Well, I know you have your issues, but she, uh, and I did too, but you know, she ruled the roost and the men were kind of in the background compared to, to mom. For sure. I think that, you know, looking back, putting aside the fact that I didn't have a very good relationship with her, there was something very powerful about her. And I think, you know, she sort of created this line of feminine energy that we're all still working off of and through. Hmm. In her case, she probably could have, you know, expressed (laughs) it in a healthier way. But also to your point, I remember you saying that she was incredibly musical and a brilliant performer and she was very much suppressed. That's right. So tell me about that. Well, she was discouraged from uh, her first marriage. She was, uh, they were in Germany. My, that side of the family, my half brother, William Menick and son, they're 13 generations of violin makers. And each, each son would go and study with the, with the um, person who taught them in Europe. That was a tradition for many, many years. And mother was there with, uh, we called him Uncle Bill. We were all very close, even though they were divorced. It's kind they of a started... little bit of conscious uncoupling there. That's right. <laughs> now you know where I get it. Yeah. She was a dazzler. She was really beautiful. I mean, she I always was. said she was the prettiest of certainly of our generation and hers of all of her sisters. And she would walk into a club and she they'd strike up, Dinah, is there anything finer? And she was in her element with her frou-frou, you know, her ostrich feather thing. And she was just, she just adored it. And they, she was asked to record with a band in Germany and her husband, I don't think, I think he discouraged that. So I think there was, she was frustrated. Yeah. And sort of through me, wanted me to be a glamorous actress and have long red nails and bleach, bleached hair and couldn't understand why I was attracted to these <laughs> non-glamorous roles. You're definitely more alternative than your mother. Yeah. If that and would politically, have been too. I mean, my sure. parents were Republicans, and they were furious with me when I registered as a Democrat. I went to a Quaker school, and my best friend's mother had been carried out of the Treasury Department on a stretcher during the Vietnam War, and, you know, <laughs> bad mom, and, oh, they didn't even want me to really go there, but to visit, but they grew to love them. But um, yeah, they were very. So you very were different. still a very free thinker. I think it was the Quaker influence. How so? Well, they're you know peace peace people, and uh, that was really all that education that I had at George School and had been to a Quaker school in first grade. So I think it just kind of permeated. I remember going, you taking us to Quaker meeting when we were oh, little, and I loved it because they served tang in the <laughs> in the children's section downstairs. <laughs> remember, we used to go to Westwood yes, all the time until that strange woman wanted to wash your feet and pretend I think it was she was a married. Jesus thing. <laughs> was, I don't know. I was kind of into it. It was very, and it was the West Coast version <laughs> of, of Quaker. Of Quaker, <laughs> not the Richard Nixon, but. <laughs> So you you went to George School, you were thinking about, or you were being educated in this socialism, <laughs> socialism, and, and a, peace, and uh, social responsibility. And did they nurture your acting there as well, or your? Music? There was a wonderful acting teacher there, and that's actually where where I started. Well, I was watching my parents at the Parent Teacher Association. They were so glamorous and they'd dress up, mom would dress up and dad had his tux on and they'd entertain everybody with Jeanette McDonald, Nelson Eddy, you know, dazzling. Poor daddy could never remember his words as, which I inherited sadly, and he'd read them off his cuffs. <laughs> so when you graduated George School, where did I you- I want to talk about you. Mom, well, you can't talk about me. This is about you. I'm interviewing you. <laughs> You're my daughter. Well, all right. Maybe later. Go ahead. So, what happened after George School? Well, after George School, I wanted to come to New York and be an actress. And my dad said, No, you have to either you could go to Germany for a year because there was a very good exchange program. Uh, and I was friendly with the exchange student that year, or go to college. And so I chose to go to uh, Berlin. 
which was a v- bizarre year because it was the year the wall was beginning to be built. The people were escaping and All right. shot at. We could hear them at our school, and the it was it was very intense. And I, you know, wanted to, uh, but I, I joined America House and a little group at America House. And as the people were escaping, they would come, some of them who ma- managed to, would come to America House to get their papers processed and sit in the audience while we were up there performing things like, I'm just wild about Harry. And they were sitting in tears, <laughs> oh my having just escaped. I always wish I could be a writer and really write about it. And I'd uh, say, are they crying because we're so bad? <laughs> they said, no, they just escaped. So that had made a, quite an Did impact. Did you have a boyfriend in Berlin? I had a, a young friend, but not a boyfriend. Not that a was a really slow starter. Really? It was a wonderful, funny, poor boy whose mother had killed herself. I was very drawn to him. He was a dear lost soul. Oh, dear. That's what dad used to call a (laughs) fixer-upper. We're not in the fix-him-up business. Oh, my gosh. That's right. So, but were you in love with him? No. No. It was just just a good, it was like a little brother. So you had a whole year in Berlin. Yeah, very long time. Unlike you, it's a short time in Spain. I wish they had them I curtailed them a bit. I wish I'd gone to Paris, actually. Did it feel too long? Yeah, it was strange. It was, well, it was a very odd, you know, it was a fraught time. It was fraught with all kinds of uh, political upheaval and darkness. And it was, was not a pleasant time now. So you came back and you enrolled in Bard College. I went to Bard College back in the... The days when it isn't as grand as it is now academically. Now it's hard to get into Bard. Then they just said, come, <laughs> we need people. <laughs> <laughs> now it's impossible to get Yeah, in. but it was great. I mean, it was a weird. What was the best thing about terrific, it? Terrific, uh, you know, terrific drama, d- drama department. We would be doing Shakespeare out in the out in the garden and have to hold with our arms extended doing Shakespeare while the train passed below, you know, it was, it was, it was wonderful. It was crazy and a lot of nutty people. Yeah. You had a boyfriend there. Yeah, a couple. You don't want to talk about nah. it. Why not? Oh, why? Because Father. it's so fascinating. Lots of laughter, which was great. Okay. But nobody as say. funny as your dad, you know. I have to say, when you were born, he always used these sports analogies, which I always went over my head. But they said, when you were born, they said, oh, we want to take a picture. We always photograph it. And Daddy said, forget about it. She looks like Rocky Graziano after the Sugar Ray Roberts <laughs> fight. Because you had this beautiful large head, which didn't want to come through oh, very easily. You were all smushed. So I was a hideous newborn, what, is what you're hilarious. saying. It was hilarious. He always had a sports <laughs> analogy. And then he was racing up the... Pacific Coast Highway to where we were living in Trancas. I was still in the hospital and uh, had these, got pulled over by the cops and he had It's a Girl buttons all over him and he jumped out and he said, forget about it. Not tonight. Not tonight. Oh my God. He loved life more than anyone I've ever known. I know. Except maybe you. You got that from <laughs> You're jumping too. ahead. Well, I've always been curious about your romantic life before dad, because, you know, daddy was such a huge figure in your life and all of our lives. And so I I always wondered, was there anybody else you ever loved? Well, the fact, you know, it's funny. I don't know that I did. Wow. It's very, it's, I think he was my little, he was my big savior. You know, I met him and immediately just womp, just felt this is the only person. And, and I adored my, my father and my brothers, but the first person who I f- felt was completely comfortable in his own skin. I don't think I had ever experienced quite that because. I, my dad was a great gentleman and always was incredibly kind and proper. Bruce used to joke he came over and had his first Jewish meal, as he called it, you know, from Zabar's. He said he never unbuttoned his vest, <laughs> his three-piece suit. His first Jewish meal. Bruce, I mean, I love first it. 
bagel and dad had never had lox and bagels. And um, Bruce was very taken with him. He, he, he really loved my father. You know what I, I wanted to know was how did you start your professional acting career after college? What was the break? Well, I'd been, you know, I had wonderful time with at, at Bard and uh, met. I had a great teacher there, Charlie Kakasakis, who said people used to say it meant sheets of checkers in Greek, but it didn't. Kakasakis. Kakasakis. Sounds a like an gr- ailment of the <laughs> anus or something. <laughs> Well, then we had Nikos Sakharopoulos. I was attracted to all these Greek, you know, from Williamstown. Uh, so Charlie said, listen, there's a great co- uh, company, Fishgill, New York, and I'd like you to play Laura in the Glass Menagerie. Said He said, you'll get your equity card. I went, no kidding. So I played Laura in the Glass Menagerie and got my equity card. And then after that, I guess I went up to the theater company of Boston where Dustin Hoffman, uh, Bobby Duval, uh, Ralph Waite, that was, wow. you know, and then Ben Affleck's dad was the stage manager. Oh, that's Timmy right. Timmy Affleck, who became a good friend. And so all of these uh, guys were acting in this weird little pl- cockroach-infected theater. Was it in rap? What plays were it you? It was in, in the Terrain Hotel, which no longer exists. They finally tore it down. And it was repertory, yeah. And they would never, they would make up their mind the last week. You want to stay and play a, a whore or do you want to be an angel this week? Or you want to, you know, it was always something different. And you had a week to do these little one-act plays. And that was great. I didn't great... realize that when you went to do The Great Santini, you had already worked with Bobby Duval. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Well, no, I hadn't worked with Bobby. I observed Bobby. Okay. Dustin and Bobby and Paul Benedict, all these actors were doing Waiting for Good Dough and the cocktail party. I was there really to observe. I didn't I didn't work with them. And so you finished up there and where And did then you I next? got my first role off Broadway was I was hired because I could speak German and of all the girls that auditioned, they told me I was the only skinny girl who spoke German because <laughs> I was supposed to be starving in the Second oh, World God. War. So I got it by default. Everybody else were Brunhildes, who I guess who walked in. And then soon after that came, you know, I met Daddy and I went to audition for him. And he was hurling all these witticisms from the theater while I was trying to work up my emotion. I thought, who is this jerky guy? I'm supposed to cry. And he was just so darn funny. He was always. And then that kind of was it. And then you got the lead in Butterflies Are Free. Yeah. And what was that like? Your first? I actually didn't want to do it. You know, again, I thought I was such a very serious actress. And I read 17 pages and I said to Bruce, will you read this? I don't know. It seems awfully fluffy to me. And he said, yeah, well, go up and meet the director. And I I should have really done more of this. I said, I don't know that this is right for me. <laughs> Whenever I did that, I always was sought after. <laughs> so the director, uh, Milton Caselis, another Greek, he said, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. Keir DeLay and Eileen Heckert. And so I said, well, I needed the work. So I did it. And I was astonished that it was a big hit. I was sure it wouldn't be. And what was that like to be kind of the belle of Broadway when you were 26? I wish I had enjoyed it more. I sort of felt I didn't, I hate to say it because it sounds sort of, but I assure you it's true. I felt I didn't deserve it. I felt I hadn't done enough. You know, I had just come out of a a repertory and off-Broadway, very just sort of thought, why am I? Why am I doing this? And actually, Eileen Heckert didn't want me after I won the Tony. She didn't want my name above the title because she said she hadn't deserved it. <laughs> that's very, that's the old way that really, right. that's not casting dispersions on Eileen as much as that was really the thought yeah. back then. Do you remember that night when you won the Tony? Uh, I wasn't thrilled. Isn't that awful? No, just it is what it is. Well, Why? the opening night was the night that Daddy asked my dad if he could marry me. And my mom wasn't thrilled about it. She thought he was stealing my thunder. <laughs> I don't think that way. So to me, it was so strange. Stealing my thunder. 
It wasn't all that heavy. I I I, I don't know why. I guess it's that Lutheran hair shirt thing. Right. <laughs> it's pretty. It gets deep. That psychology. Well, you enjoyed your night, didn't you? Except for me, who was sort of a sourpuss. It was a strange night. I mean, I think it's interesting that we both won these awards when we were 26. 26, that's right. That's pretty, it's yeah. a strange parallel. Right. I I found it really overwhelming. and Yeah, but you had, until then, you'd won everything. SAG, Screen Actors Guild. <sighs> but it's really, at the end of the day, all about. Well, you you know what? With you, it came so easily to you. I was always astonished. Acting? Yes. You, as I talked about how you were so musical at such a young age. And you just, it was so deep within you. And I always thought, she doesn't have to struggle. I mean, you always got it. You knew the character, the accent, the... The core of the person, I mean, I was just astonished. And people, I had some women who actually said to me, are you jealous of your daughter? And to, to me, was the most extraordinary. She was born of me. Why would I not be? Right. How could I be jealous of her? I was so incredibly... And I got it all from you. No, I don't... Absolutely. Daddy, Daddy was very creative in his own right. He couldn't <laughs> carry a tune, though. No, he could, <laughs> definitely couldn't. But but it, that it was different, you know. I mean, you talked about that thing that I said to Katie Couric, but it's so true. When I was little and always in Williamstown and watching you rehearse plays, and not only were you so powerful, but you seemed so on fire. You were just yeah. so impassioned and free, and I you really showed me what the art of acting mm. was, you know? Oh, sweetie, I, it makes me sad to think that I wasn't, had to have any of that in my life. I mean, as I a person, think I don't true. think I did. I don't think that's true. I Which just is think also that, a reason I chose your dad, because he was the one who was... I just think you always felt far more comfortable on stage yeah. than you did off stage. That's true. Absolutely true. And I think it's true of so many actors. I heard an interview with Maggie Smith years ago who said she felt that she was alive when she was working and didn't know what to do with herself when she wasn't, right. which I thought was astonishing. And so you had this beautiful, successful career, and then you got married. And it was all downhill. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I really wanted to quit and, and raise children, but I didn't realize that I had enough cuckoo inside uh, that I had to have an outlet for it. You can't just sort of, at least I couldn't just shut off that switch. And I was not a, a good mother, I realized, unless I could that? have an outlet. Well, there was that creative part that I couldn't deny that. I was trying to find that fire in that life. And I felt, I felt that I did at times with you all, but I also would run away, wouldn't I? Which I have tremendous guilt about. Why? I would, because I, well, I think, I think all working mothers, whether you're an actor or not, if you're drawn back to your work, you feel guilty. You feel you should be there 24 hours. But I couldn't function as a good mother unless I had that outlet. And I feel I really did damage to you guys at times when I really had to escape. I felt that I had failed. Failed how? By not being present all the time. As I found, I, I learned a lot from you too late, unfortunately. But to be present, to be completely present. And I would sit there with you all and play and then I'd say... I, I think I'm boring them. I've got to find something too more enriching. I'm not enough. You know, I always had that stupidity. Hovering. Why do you think that so many women have this imprint that they're not enough? Do you think it's generational or do you think that everybody even in your generation has it? Because you're all so much more evolved than we were. I mean, you have so much more information. You've gone to therapy. You know, my mother said, you were not going, you don't go to therapy. We come from a strong stock, which I always thought was the most bizarre thing to say. And Especially because she was like, well, <laughs> bipolar. No, I don't know. 
who knows, but you, uh, you sought it. You knew that you needed to have that. And look how you've, look how you never stopped. You have more curiosity than anyone I've ever known. And your dad had that too. Your, your love of art. We were told you could be a great art historian, a lawyer. Uh, your brain was so much like dad's, thank God. But your curiosity and your never-ending searching, look where you are now. You mogul. Oh, please. <laughs> You're always on the search for... I have, like, bags under my eyes oh. and B.O. and <laughs> <laughs> You do not. When you work out and you're uh, in great shape, you, but, you never stop searching. And that, that to if, me, is your greatest... That's true. I am a searcher. Uh, yes. I don't know. I wonder about that. I think I think my generation still very much carries that imprint. A lot of us do that we're not enough. No, just, why is that? I don't. I think it's just transgenerational. I think it's just something that happened at some point when you were with the children all the time, as you were early on. Did you feel that? As uh, now that you were, then you no. were doing film and working. No, I felt that more in the in the pie chart of my life and the romantic slice i always looked for confirmation that i wasn't enough through the boyfriend that i had you always were able to have rich relationships some of them didn't work out but you yeah, always... but some of them were with very damaged men when i had apple my experience of myself was completely transformed yes and i felt like you were so in love I her. was so in love with Smitten. her. I still am. I know. And then you speak of, the, and then when you had the, had Mosey, it went through the oh, difficulty I, of. Terrible postnatal post, depression. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think was really shocking to me because I had, I never thought that I would be a person who got postnatal depression and I was so euphoric when Apple was born and I assumed that it would happen with Mosey and it just it took a while that I really went to a dark place did you have any hormonal uh, imbalance or anything after Jake or I were born I, I don't remember I did I just know I wanted a lot of kids I would have go, gone on and had because I, I had great pregnancies and deliveries and I just thought this is so I wanted I wanted more because I would it, it would make me feel more full too. Right. That, you know, I thought it would be great for you to have f siblings and a big family, but Daddy always said we we're always going back and forth from coast to coast, and it's not good to do to kids. And but I I don't remember that. I just remember wanting more. Do you regret not I, having? I more? do. I do. I think it would have been great for you guys to have a family I have more, more kids yeah you know really to I take care of too. each other and yeah be part of a big family yeah. is, is a th I, well I mean the, I know people who don't even speak to their some of their siblings you know that came from big families yeah. I mean it's also individual that experience but yeah we'll have more of my mom in a minute in the meantime let's talk about one of our partners one thing we've learned about some of the brilliant thinkers, disruptors, and innovators that we get to interview for Goop.com and the Goop podcast is that they consume an insane amount of books. And while we don't have to sell anyone on the merits of reading, finding the time to actually sit down and read can be tricky. This is why Audible is such an excellent resource, allowing you to listen to audiobooks from anywhere and on any device. You can even switch between your laptop, your phone, and your tablet and still pick up exactly where you left off. Their audiobook library hovers in the hundreds of thousands of titles, including ones from Goop Press authors like The Clarity Cleanse by Habib Sadegi, The Food Therapist by Shira Lenchuski, and coming up on May 1st, The Sex Issue by the Goop Editors. Sign up for a free 30-day trial and your first audiobook is covered. Go to audible.com slash goop or text goop to 500-500. That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash goop or text goop to 500-500 to get started. Okay, let's get back to my mom. So 
so how did you reconcile working and being a mother? I don't, it, you know, I never had a conscious, I never had a game plan. I never, I would sort of, that's one of the things about being an actor and I, with the, without producer talent or, you know, I never had a strategy or could I do this or could I maybe assemble a group of people to do that. I just sort of flew by the seat of my pants. And, and a lot of times there were terrible things that came up, you know, that before daddy started doing so well, there were some TV movies I'd like to burn. <laughs> and, Everybody uh, loves your Columbo episode. Uh, <laughs> I hear that I all the time. pregnant with you. <laughs> so there was never, it was just kind of, well, let the wisp, let's see what's next. So I never really... And then I didn't. Then we were in New York, and I didn't do any theater for a long time. Yeah, you were in L.A. working, yeah. and on location. And you brought us to some fabulous places when we were little. What's your best memory? Of well, that? you know, Beaufort. I, I loved when you did the Great Santini, and we all lived in Beaufort. It's a really indelible. It's bizarre. I didn't realize I was so young when Hamlin O'Kelly was just over. I didn't realize I was only six. I remember it so clearly. I know. That made me kind of sad because you talk about that a lot, being your favorite time of your life. And we were there two months at the most. It's so funny. I think there was the just, freedom. There was a lot of freedom. And, Camaraderie. Yeah, it was really. And that, that Southern way is so warm and Eccentric. specific and funny. Right. It's true. You wrote a note to my friend, to my beloved crab catcher taught you how to catch yeah. crab you already had some of your oh, eloquence what was your favorite role that you've done well probably blanche and street street car named desire and masha and three sisters and the seagull nina when you knew that speech at the end before i did i'd been slaving on it for weeks and you listened to it a couple of times in my rehearsing and men in beef flying the eagle the heart with this. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. And then we did the seagull together. Yes. Years later. Yeah. Why are you making that? Well, face? just because it was so different. I mean, it was it it was I was hard on you during that. That's okay. I knew no, it. Was, I was not fair to you. Why? I be, well again, it came so damn easily to you, and I thought you had to sweat blood and tears to give a great performance, and you never did. And I should have. I wish I had recognized that. I wish I had recognized your otherness and embraced it. You know, I could cry that, about oh. the fact that I didn't. I just, Daddy did. Daddy saw you. Well, you were such a big part of him too. I think your DNA or your essence had so much of him. Do you think it it bothered you that that it, I was I sort of insouciant about the role and the part or what was it? You it, it just came easily and you didn't have to work hard at it. And I remember there were times you came in and kind of rolled your eyes and went, oh, again, we have to or I already have that or you I know, still and I do just that. Say, oh my God, you've got to bite into it. You gotta go deeper. You gotta hurt. You know, I mean, you were 19, first of all, to be playing that part. Nobody plays Nina at that. A very few people, I think. You can't tackle that role till you're 30 or late 20s. I mean, as far as I'm concerned. I wasn't that good at it anyway. It I needed a, some. It was a strange production, except for, well, I, I'd go anywhere to with, work with Chris Walk, and I adore oh him. Oh, my He's... God. Mom, do you remember that <laughs> night he got drunk on stage with me? I know. He was, he, he was, the, but you know what? As wacky as he can be, he is such a company person. His heart, he's yeah. always there to catch you. Unfortunately, not that night because he just happened to, <laughs> to be drinking. He, he didn't was normally. drinking. This is when this is in the 90s. Now and he's they still had, alive. So that's because, okay. We love him. But it's, really it's, it's, it's an him. empirical fact. He he was getting these like cocktails in a can. Do you remember? No. And they were in his dressing room. And I, I remember don't. thinking, my gosh, what is that? <laughs> And then we were on stage and he was doing his giant monologue. And then he started weaving back and forth and then he forgot all his lines. And, and you were on the floor. I'll never forget that. And you saved it. You came in and you you saved the, the Did scene. I? Oh, God. You came off, I remember, and I embraced you and said, oh, my God. And you were giving him coffee. And then we gave him coffee downstairs and 
I told, I think, told him deep, but he is a brilliant, brilliant talent. And yeah, he's I, I would go anywhere to work with Chris. I've never met anybody as true as So you actor. loved working with Christopher Walken? Love. Who else? What are the other actors that you loved working with? Oh, gosh. We had that company up there, Olympia Dukakis and Louis Zorch, who sadly, who just died, Lee Grant. Then we had... Oh, I, I adored working with Raul Julia. Best kisser ever on stage. Ooh. Really nice lips. <laughs> <laughs> I love and, it. And, uh, oh, there are tons. Bobby Duval, you know, talk about being unleashed and going where he would just let it rip. He, he taught me a lot. The actors, the well, actors and the people who were rebels. That's cool. You included. What? was it like for you when I decided that I wanted to be an actor or when did you know that I wanted to do it? You didn't really talk about it. It was funny. You didn't, you, you would join the companies, you know, if they needed a little boy in Williamstown, you had short hair and you, uh, I remember Kate Burton said, I knew she was going to be a big star because she asked, you carried a dog on? And you made an entrance in Cyrano. You made an entrance on your toes and you carried a, a puppy onto the stage. And she said, I knew it then, the way she made that entrance. It sounds like <laughs> ham, ham time. You have to have a little of that. Yeah. But um, no, I just, I didn't know. I guess when you were, we were doing Picnic together, you were so great in that role as, uh, what was her name? Oh, I don't the, remember. The Ingenue. No, and, I wasn't the ingenue. Jane Krakowski no, Jane was. Jane Krakowski, yes, but you I played the her little sister, sister yeah. with us, with Tony Goldwyn, and what, what that was wild. And you, uh, at the curtain call, people were stomping when you came on and cheering and carrying on. And Daddy and I had said to you before that you have to go to college, you have to go to college, you can act. But and then I think Dad looked at me or just said, "Let's forget about it. She's great." So then you had our permission anyway to... Yes, to quit college. Yeah. I did go to college. I went to UC Santa Barbara <laughs> for for almost one full year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to ask you a little bit about dad and your marriage and how the part that that played in your life and especially in your artistic life because you, you guys... It was sort of like a boomerang. I felt like he would let you go. He he was very generous. And you would come back. He'd always say, I'll do the commerce, you do the art. You know, and then he had these wonderful shows saying elsewhere, the white shadow, they were art in themselves. Someone said to me the other day, which I'd forgotten, that at Memorial that Steven Spielberg talked about, Daddy, and said, Bruce Paltrow was his art. I had forgotten that. He influenced so many people. I mean, to this day, people say to me, this is 15 years later after he's gone, they say, we often say, uh, WWBD, what would Bruce do? He he just was an, an, a non-ending font of support and help, you know, changed so many lives. Yeah, he was very good at seeing in people what their special thing was and amplifying yeah. it. I mean, a, a hairdresser came up to me a long ago and said, your dad changed my life. I said, what? Not your dad, my dad. Uh, my, your dad <laughs> changed my life. I said, why? He said, well, I was sitting at a table with a bunch of movie stars and I thought I don't belong here and got up and went outside and your dad came, came out and said, what are you doing here? You're as good as anybody sitting at that table. Got in there. You know, he was a great egalitarian, and he, and he talked to the guy who swept out the studio exactly the same way as he did the head of the studio or the network. Yeah. He was, uh, he, every so often he'd have a black and blue shin because under the table I'd give him a I knock. Him. Well, you were so different, my we God. We were so different. People said we wouldn't last past a year. I mean, <laughs> and you... then I look at our wedding photos, and we and everybody else was divorced. You were the only ones who <laughs> made it. Through. My, my brother and his wife. What do you think being a mother? How did it change you? Oh, gosh. Well, as an actor, 
having children. What I love the most about it is the focus completely just shift, shifted. I, n- I no longer, my, I was not my priority anymore. I mean, I didn't do it as well as I would like to have done it, but you, you were both my heart, my raison d'etre. I mean, this was all I'd really, I'd, I'd wanted children from the time I was a little girl. Loved, loved kids. Why, I know you always think that you weren't a good mother, and I don't agree, but what would you do differently, do you think? I would have, in your particular case, I would have been able to have, I would have sought the wisdom, therapy, or whatever else, to see who you were, rather than try to mold you to something you weren't. And what about for Jake? And Jake was an easier child, you know, I think... The boys in our family all seem to be somehow less assertive or, or less, what's the word? Confrontational? Yeah. He was just easier. Right. But I was always, I mean, I see it in each generation. There's there's some of that. Right. To honor who you are. And I wish I had done more of that. Do you feel like you honored who you were? <laughs> I hadn't even considered that. How do you mean? Like giving yourself the freedom to really understand who you are and then giving yourself the freedom to fully no, inhabit that. No, I was that. a dope. I didn't, I didn't go into therapy. And if I did, I lasted a week with like six different people. <laughs> I was just, well, I just no, couldn't because I settle. I wonder how you would expect to honor who a little girl was if you weren't even fully honoring who you were. It doesn't seem like something to beat yourself up over. Maybe I just came into the world that way. <clears throat> I always felt you came into the world as you were going to be strong and wailing and here I am world, you know? I just think, I, I think you really do. I'm not, not to uh, diminish Parent, the influence we have as parents, but I think you basically come into the world as you're going to be. You can be certainly guided, and I think that it's really the environment that you grow up in yeah. is really important, especially well, it's, in early it's important. Yeah. childhood. And my philosophy with my kids has been: I, I agree with you in that I think they have come in with who they are, but then I think you can fuck it up. Oh, sure. Yeah, I think you know. It's it's really an art, I think, to be a parent and to parent try to parent consciously as opposed to out of instinct. Yeah, and which I, you've done incredibly well, well. You know, but it's 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 difficult sometimes, especially because Mosey and I are so similar in a lot of ways, and he we have the same bad qualities. So <sighs> sometimes I find it really triggering with him. And I always, you know, have to think like, okay, you know, try to put a pause in between what you're feeling and what you're going to do or say next. And I think, you know, you guys just came from a generation where you just didn't, yeah, you didn't apply a a philosophy through it, maybe. And we also, we also didn't agree, you know, some of our largest disputes were over you and dad. Yeah, how to how to rear. You know, I felt, no, oh, they shouldn't get allowance until they'd empty the dishwasher and clear the table. And, and dad said, oh, leave him alone. I mean, you know, even though he had his very strict areas. Oh, we, yeah. We, we never really, I think that's really important. And the only advice I would give to young parents is try to is be as much as you can in the, in the same, the same ballpark. As your co-parent. Yeah. Right. Co-parenting. Yeah. Because kids, and you were so smart, and Jake, you so smart, you pick up on those things. Yeah. You often learn how to play play them against one another, oh, too. Oh, yeah. It's but, a child specialty. Uh, yeah. But it's really, um, that was frustrating to me, that we weren't always on the same page. Right. Dad was clearer. I think I was a little less clear about what I was trying to, and then I would have guilt about, you know, I was too rough. Ah. What are you going to do? You know what? What are you going to do? The way I look at it is for whatever mistakes you made as a mother, 
I look at those those things that might have been confusing or hurtful or lonely or any of those set of feelings that any child has based on the humanity of their parent, the humanness of their parent, those are the things that become building blocks. Those are the things that really... You learn from. Yeah, you really hone your focus and you think, wow, I want to be like that, like her in that way, and I don't want to be like him in that way. And But I think all of the hurts that we go through, all of those sufferings are exactly as they're meant to be. And I'm I'm very grateful because I feel like I grew up in a house with a lot of love and you weren't perfect and daddy wasn't perfect, but neither am I and neither is anybody. And you forgive it. I definitely and have. Somebody, where did I read the other day? It was such a great quote. I think it was from Maya Angelou. Basically, it was that you don't really forgive until you can absolutely let go right. of, of all of the things that were, have, been done, have been done damage to you. Yeah. And and to see the the person. I read a fantastic quote about forgiveness in the New York Times pretty recently, where it was a kind of a modern day philosopher, and they were saying that in order to really forgive, you have to let go of spite and then constantly remind yourself about what is beautiful about the other person. And I had never, Spite. yeah, because you hang on, you know, when you feel I was wronged and I had never named it as spite before, but there's that sharp, hot feeling mm-hmm. when you haven't forgiven somebody. And if you kind of go underneath the intention, it's, I want you to pay for what you did. And that's spite, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. So you really have to let go of that. Right. And sometimes it's difficult to let go of that. It's such a human instinct. No matter, I mean, even the people that I talk to who I really, you know, my peace lovers, my 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 dear, my, you know, my two best friends are one is a peace worker and a potter, and the other is a social worker. And then I'll see, uh, so peace loving, and then I'll see those things pop out and I, wow. Well, we're it's all, true. I think also the, the tendency that we have to be reductive and say, one person is a peace worker, so that means she's not allowed to be a human being. And we all have anger and hurt and yeah. we have to look at ourselves in that, in a holistic way. And I certainly think that's what I try to do in the way I regard myself as a mother, because it's, it's really hard. And I think it's easy to do what you've done in a way, which is look back with regret. And I don't think you should. Mm. I'm still working on it. I have a few years left, I hope. <laughs> I think this is the best conversation I've had with you since we lay in bed and <laughs> made up songs. But thank you for giving so much of yourself to me. Thank you thank for, you for giving. being such an extraordinary human being, daughter. Thanks, Mom. Sometimes I think she can't be my daughter. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And the search goes on and you keep teaching me too. And you keep teaching me. What do you want for Mother's Day? You already gave me that beautiful bag. So? <laughs> I walk around like not... a bag lady with plastic bags <laughs> and my daughter is so appalled. So she ran out and got me a gorgeous <laughs> bag, which I just carry all the time. Well, we were at an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> and she came to it with. Uh, well, I'm always recycling everything. You certainly are. That and was, I thought, that's, this is no way also for my Blythe big... Danner to go to an appointment with four plastic bags and well, a falling I was apart one from the co-op them. in Santa Monica. <laughs> that's that's something, too, that's my, one of my biggest passions. And I'm glad I did teach you some of that, that the earth, did. to be good to the earth. My favorite story was when we were dra- driving. I made up a big sign that's put to put by the the window of the car that said, "You're polluting." <laughs> and we put it up. You would your job at three was to hold up the sign to big d- diesel trucks with spewy black <laughs> smoke. And we stopped at a light, and you opened the window and said to the truck driver, "You're polluting." <laughs> and he said, "What?" 
you, he said, then you said it again. He said, oh, I am. I thought he was going to come and turn the car over. <laughs> Big, muscly, red-faced guy. He said, well, I'm going to go to get that fixed right now. Oh, See, you've taught me to be an environmentalist from a young age. Yeah. It's, it's a, a very important now. part, oh, I think, of what, we, what we're trying to do at Oh, gotta get. Well, we don't want to get too political, but we got to get rid of Mr. Your, Pruitt, your, your favorite person, and everybody else involved. It's all going to come. It's going to, you know, too much progress has been made. And I just read that all these things he spouts on about half the he's doing them so ineptly that the courts are fighting him, the judges are pushing him down. I don't think he's going to get half of it accomplished. I've never really understood why not protecting the environment. They all have is, children. Exactly. Grandchildren. I don't understand why that's a partisan issue. And cancer is such an epidemic. It's, you know, it's so much of it has to do with with our pollution and plastics in the ocean and fish gobbling up the plastics. I don't even want to eat fish anymore. Yeah. It's, I think we all have to strive to become more plant-based, which you've done so credibly with your not, it's, not, not always. No, but I mean those recipes. Everybody thinks I'm vegetarian. Yeah, Everybody well. thinks I eat like a, a sheet of nori <laughs> and. Uh, no, you make it clear that you cashew better. cheese. <laughs> Shit, I would never eat. But your recipes are so good. Why can't I ever yes. open them up? I'm such a dope when it comes to the internet. Oh. Yeah, we've got to get you a little more tech savvy. <laughs> Maybe for Mother's Day, I'll get you a, a class with an IT person. Oh, you know, it'll go right in one ear and out the other. I don't you know. know that that's true. From my standpoint, you have had this amazing life. Not that it's always been easy, but you have these wonderful friends and children who love you and grandchildren who adore you. And you've had this incredible career. And I just wonder... What do you, are, are there things left that you still really want to accomplish? You know, I'm, I'm happy to say that I really, really like my own company and I've become a bit of a hermit, which I have to be careful of. I got to get you on J-Date. Oh, no, no. I would be I got to get you on Tinder, Mom. I would, oh, pff, right. I'd just be happy being with uh, my grandkids and few friends I have, I'm, I'm, ne I've never been a big social person. It's you know? true. I, I mean, I, I admire it and I love watching you and I love being with your friends. That's, that's some of the most fun I have being around all your colorful, fun friends. And I love your, I love your girlfriends in the time, kindergarten and Spence and high school. That is very fulfilling. And some of them they love have you become so my good friends, you know? know. So sweet. I, I don't really, I feel I've, I've never been really ambitious. I don't have great plans to do other roles. There's not one that you they, haven't done no, yet. I think part, being a part of a theater company and being on stage from the beginning, that's what I, I love to do is, is be in a company. And, you know, in the last film, I did with a couple that I've done with Brett Haley the, from, you know, he has a little repertory company that was now. Fabulous. Do you want a boyfriend? No. Mom, Jake As, and I want you to have a boyfriend. I, I have no interest. Really, I don't. You know okay. what? If I got my heart broken, I'd probably jump off of the railing. Oh, okay. And, well, then... and if I, and I don't want to be bored. So it's one or the other. I, I, I can also go to goop.com and get you a vibrator. Oh, we can leave it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much, but no thanks. <laughs> uh, is no, there anything I'm else happy. you want to add? No, I've just said I can't get over you. And, I, and that you wanted to talk to me. I'm thrilled, as what I said. What do you mean? You're it's so... hard to get you on the phone, so I'm glad I got you here. It's hard to get you to open up. Did I? You did. Good. Well, thank you for coming and doing this. Okay. Well, thank you, sweetheart. I love you. I love you. Happy Mother's Day. I love you Day. more. I love thank you, you more. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining our conversation today. I hope it might small reminder to anyone listening that you're enough. You can see my mom in Hearts Beat Loud starting June 8th alongside Nick Offerman, and Kiersey Clemens. And later this fall, she plays Hilary Swanks and Michael Shannon's mom in What They Had alongside Robert Forster. 
Next week, I'll get back to doing rounds of Ask Me Anything. If you have a question, drop us a line at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for this week's episode of the Goop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share with your friends. To keep up with new episodes, just hit subscribe. And for more info, head over to goop.com slash the podcast. See you next week.